Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Lucky Ghost, and today we're going to be talking about something really important. This is five huge mistakes that new and returning players should avoid making while playing ESO this year. A lot has been changing in ESO, and there's a lot of really important things that you should understand before diving in. So if you've never played the game before, or maybe you've just been away for a while, knowing these five things is going to be really important to your success on your journey. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to go ahead and rapid fire some bonus tips to keep you pointed in the right direction. Okay, one of the first things that you need to understand as a new and returning player is refining. Refining is really important in ESO. You're going to find a lot of materials out in the wild, and then you're going to come to one of these benches here. You've got clothing, jewelry, right? Each of these benches, depending on the type of gear that it's going to create, has its own refining section where you can turn raw materials into materials that you actually use to upgrade your gear from blue to purple, purple to gold, and so on. So it's going to be really important that you do this, and you're going to save hundreds of thousands and even millions of gold in the long run by doing this. However, you're going to lose hundreds hundreds of thousands or even millions of gold in the long run if you don't do it right. There is absolutely a right and a wrong way to do this. So let's talk about the right way to do this. You're always going to want to refine on the character dedicated as your crafter. Most likely it's going to be your main character because that one is going to have an excess of skill points. So it's going to be really easy to dump the extra skill points into the essential crafting lines. So if we open up our crafting menu and we see, for example, under blacksmith and each one of these crafting lines is going to have the same exact passives, whether it's blacksmithing, clothing, jewelry, provisioning, woodworking, right? All of the ones that create gear are going to have these passives for refining that are very, very important. And they're also going to have passives for upgrading your gear. That's also important. We'll touch on that as well. The, the big one is going to be extraction. So you've got wood extraction, you've got metal extraction and so on. Every one of them has a passive just like this. And it says it maximizes the chances of extracting ingredients from uh, materials whenever you deconstruct your gear at the bench. But it's also got a chance of refining more powerful tempers from raw materials. So before or you refine, make sure you have maxed this passive out. This is really big. This is going to save you a lot of money. If you're getting gold crafting materials by refining, right? These things sell for many, many thousands of gold. You get a few of them and you're saving yourself hundreds of thousands of gold. If you don't have this maxed out, you're not going to be getting those gold refining materials, right? There's one other thing that we can do to further increase the materials that we get when we extract and refine. And that's in our champion points under the green tree. You have meticulous disassembly, which says it improves the chances of extracting materials while also refining better materials. So it's basically the same exact thing, except for this one node applies to all of your crafting lines. Whereas in your crafting passives, you have to level them up one at a time, three points into each one. If you max out meticulous disassembly and make sure you slot it right, you have to drag it onto the bar up there. And if you max out these passives, you are doubling your chances of getting gold crafting materials. Some of those crafting materials, especially if you're on PCNA, are going to go for 30, 70,000 and gold or even if it's jewelry crafting materials much much more than that hundreds of thousands of gold for those nice crafting materials so before you start refining be sure to max out those passives it doesn't take very long to go grab the sky shards necessary and be sure to go ahead and slide your meticulous disassembly even if you don't normally wear it it's only 3,000 gold right to respect your champion points slot it up there and you're gonna save yourself hundreds of thousands of gold in the materials that you get in return totally worth it meticulous disassembly is a very, very important. And so are these crafting passives. In addition to this, before you upgrade the material, once you have the better upgrade materials, you're going to want to level up expertise. So if your character is light armor wearing, then you're going to want to come here to tan and expertise. And it more than doubles your chances to improve your items. So instead of an item costing 20 drag wax to upgrade, it would cost eight drag wax, right? That's savings of hundreds of thousands of gold. So before you start upgrading, make sure that you're maxing out tan and expertise if you're wearing light or medium armor. And if you're upgrading heavy armor, make sure you upgrade temper expertise for your tanks. This is one of the easiest ways to make and save millions of gold in relatively short time periods in ESO. Just by having these passives when you're deconstructing gear, just by having these passives whenever you're refining, and just by having these passives when you are upgrading your gear. Another important one is a move speed passive that a lot of people don't know. It's kind of new to ESO. They added it last year, I believe. So if you've been away for longer than that, or if you didn't play ESO, it's kind of, it's not very intuitive intuitive to go here for a move speed passive, but it's under assault. And you're, what you're going to do is grab the continuous attacks passive. This is going to increase your move speed anytime you're on your mount by 30%. 30%, it's massive. It is the difference between getting on your horse and feeling like you're moving in molasses and getting on your horse and feeling like it's a substantial increase over running on foot. Grab this. It's really easy to get. It takes about five minutes in Cyrodiil. And no, you don't have to do any PVP. What you're going to do is teleport to Cyrodiil. 
You're going to open your map while you're in Cyrodiil. And then over here on the left, you're going to click open zone guide. Then from here in the bottom right, you're going to see start zone story. I've already done it. So it says explore zone. Yours would say start zone story. It doesn't require any PVP. In fact, it doesn't even take you to an area where people could PVP you if they wanted to. It's a PVE area specifically for this quest. You will not run into anyone. So don't worry about it. Okay, just go there, follow the quest. It's going to give you the option to skip ballista training. It's really important important that you do not skip ballista training. You head out and you fire off the ballistas manually. That's going to ensure that when you do the quest, you get to level three assault. See how I'm level 10. You want this to get to level three at level three, this passive unlocks and you can put one point in here and forever move 30% faster. Anytime you're on your mount. don't bother putting a second point in here. If you're not a PVP -er, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to give you 60% this time, right? You get nothing out of that second point as a PVE. -er. The next big thing to talk about is curated loot. If we click on set, I items up here in the top right corner of our collections inventory. If you're on PC, for instance, you press U and you bring up this menu, you can see collectibles, stories, housing, outfit styles, and set items. This is going to be what determines what items you have and as a result, what items can drop in this game for you. This game now has something called curated loot. So if we open this up and we click on Ordin, so the way that curated loot works is the bosses are always going to drop a piece of loot that you don't have in your catalog here, as long as there is a piece of loot in their loot table that you don't have, right? So if this boss drops weapons, for instance, the final boss of dungeons will always drop weapons and jewelry. So if there's a weapon you don't have, the boss will drop one of the weapons from that dungeon that you don't have always It's guaranteed to drop the thing you don't have if it can. So the same thing works for Overland sets, right? The sets that you get into Sean or in Glenumbra or in or in High Isle. When you're running around the zone, whenever you kill a boss, it's going to drop something from its loot table. And depending on what type of boss it is, it's going to drop something different. If we pull up the table here on justlooted.com, you can see that delve bosses are going to drop belts and boots. Overland world bosses are going to drop headpieces, chest pieces, legs and weapons. Public dungeon bosses are going to drop shoulders, hands, weapons and the domain are going to drop jewelry. So if you're trying to farm a five piece set from High Isle or any other zone, you're going to go kill the delve boss a couple times until you get the belt in the set you want. Then you're going to go kill the public dungeon bosses until you get the shoulders, the hands and the weapons that you need, right? And then you're going to do a domain or some kind of domain like event to get the jewelry that you need for that set. And then overland bosses, world bosses, you could kill those to get whatever you're missing. The overland bosses are the ones that are going to drop your head, your chest and your legs, right? Those primary pieces of your body. The way loot works in ESO is very predictable. It is not by chance what you're going to get. Bosses already have a very specific loot table depending on the type of boss they are. It works the same way in dungeons. The first few bosses in a dungeon will always drop body pieces of gear unless they have like a named drop, but it's it's a rare thing and I wouldn't worry about that. But for the most part, the first few dungeon bosses will drop a piece of armor while the final boss will always drop a weapon or a piece of jewelry from that dungeon. Chests, both inside the dungeons and overland content, they can drop anything. A chest is kind of like your wild card. It's a chance at any piece of gear that is from that area. So if it's a set that comes from that dungeon, it could drop weapons. It could drop jewelry. It could drop body armor right? The chest can drop anything. Whereas bosses, they have very specific loot tables. So one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is it's very important that you bind things to you. If you don't bind the item to you, you can keep getting the same item over and over, which could be a good thing if you're doing it to maybe make a profit on a desirable item, or it could be a bad thing if you're trying to get one of the other pieces of the set, right? So if you were trying to get the resto staff, but you kept getting the bow because when you got the bow, you never bound it to yourself, right? That would be very frustrating. So when you get gear in a dungeon, especially if you're farming this set from that dungeon, make sure every time you kill a boss, open your inventory, right click the item, click bind. As soon as you kill the boss, that way the next boss you kill will drop another piece that you don't already have yet. And then once you have collected sets, you can always come to a transmute station, any transmute station in the game. There's one in people's houses and there's also one in Clockwork City and you can click the reconstruct tab. And now any piece of gear that you've ever found before can be recrafted at any time for a transmute fee. If you found every piece of gear in that set, it's going to cost 25. If you've only found one piece of gear from that set, it'll cost 75. Basically, the more pieces you found, the cheaper it is to craft it in terms of transmutes. So when you're farming a set, make sure you bind the gear from that boss to you as soon as you find it. That way, the next boss that you kill in the dungeon won't drop a duplicate of something that you've already found. And one last thing about curated loot, it only applies to boss drops. It does not apply to chests. So a chest will always drop anything, whereas a boss will always try to drop something that you have not found yet. All right, the next piece of advice is repair kits. 
you can come to these merchants and you could buy a repair kit. And if we look at the repair kit greater, uh, we've got the grand repair kits here and they sell for 420 gold. This is highway robbery. You never want to pay 420 gold for these things. Never, ever, ever buy. That's half a grand for one repair kit. And you're going to go through these things quite often if you're repairing out in the field. Don't buy them from here. Buy them from guild traders. They're going to cost you somewhere between 40 and 80 gold a piece from a guild trader. What's a guild trader? Well, if you don't know, you just run over to one of these guys here. You can always find guild traders in any zone. They have the scale. See the scale here with the guild tabard behind it. That means it's a guild trader, whereas a scale without a tabard behind it, that is just an NPC right? Those are just NPCs. They don't have the stuff that we're looking for. Guild traders because of the tabard, NPC traders because there's no tabard. So if we come here and we talk to this guild trader and you just search for the thing you're looking for, grand repair kit, nothing will show up if you don't search. So then we're going to hit R for start search and we can see grand repair kits. Look at this. They're going for 40 a piece. The NPC trader was trying to sell you for 420 gold a pop, right? The NPC traders do not necessarily have good prices on things. And sometimes they're just straight up highway robbery for new players that don't know better. So do not buy your repair kits from them ever. Okay. And one other option you have is whenever you come to a merchant, like an NPC merchant, you could always just choose to come here and click repair and then click repair all. And then that repairs your gear as well. This can be cheaper or more expensive than repairing with repair kits, depending what you bought those repair kits for. The next thing we're going to talk about is Mundus Stones. Mundus Stones are really massive buffs that you can give your character. They're really important because you'll notice that pretty much every DPS guide in this game is suggesting that you grab Divines. Divines buffs your Mundus. If you're wearing a bunch of Divines armor, but you don't have Mundus, that trait is doing nothing for you. And you would be amazed how many people don't pick up a Mundus Stone while they're running Divines vines gear because they just feel like I haven't got around to it yet. I'll get around to it later. Don't do that. This should be maybe one of the first things you do when you make a new character. It's going to be one of the easiest ways to buff your character at level one, level two, run to the nearest Munda stone, pick it up, whatever it is. Honestly, it doesn't matter. But a really powerful one, for instance, for mag characters is going to be the Atronach. This is going to give you a ton of Magicka regen. So it's going to be a lot harder to run out of Magicka on a low level character. Here's one in green shade. You could run there anytime you want and grab this Munda stone. The Atronach Mundus is in a bunch of different zones as is every Munda stone in the game. So just Google the one you want and then run up and interact with it to slot that Munda stone. You can always check which Munda stone you have active by pressing C or opening your character menu. And it says right here, this character currently has the shadow Munda slotted. Another important one to talk about is that if you're not a tank, there's some abilities that you absolutely should not slot because whether or not you realize that those abilities are taunting the enemy. So if you've been in a dungeon and for some reason the boss keeps turning around and hitting you, even though you have a tank in the group that's holding some aggro, most of the time, well, it might be because you're using one of these abilities and you're stealing the taunts. A lot of players make this mistake at one time or another because it can be real easy to overlook. So let's just touch on the three abilities. There's only a few of them that you have to avoid. The first one is from the one hand and shield. The first ability here, here's armor or in its base version, it's called puncture. Do not use puncture or either of its morphs. That is going to taunt the boss. It's going to turn around and it's going to beat you until the tank taunts it again. This is both going to be frustrating for you and the tank that's trying to keep aggro. The next one is going to be under the Undaunted Guild and it's called Inner Fire right here or the third ability. If you take this ability and you slot it under your bar and you use it, you will grab taunts and you can see right there any ability that taunts says so in the description right there. The first line ignite fires hate in the enemy's heart, dealing a little bit of damage and taunting them for 15 seconds. Every hard taunt in this game lasts 15 seconds just FYI. It's always 15 seconds. So as long as the tank is casting that ability once every 15 seconds, he will 100% chance have taunts on that enemy. The last one is going to be from the destruction staff and it's going to be from destructive touch. And if you grab the destructive clench morph while wearing a frost staff, that's going to be a taunt as well. So just avoid those three abilities unless you are a tank. And if you are a tank and absolutely make sure you have at least one of those abilities slotted because without them, you're not a tank at all. You're just someone that's creating frustration for a party. A next quick tip is your gold. In the bottom right of your screen here in your inventory, you're going to be able to see how much gold you have. Right now, I've got 42 million gold. You're going to
going to probably have a little bit less than that. As a new player, you'll have a lot less than that. But fortunately, you don't need gold for a lot as a new player. So there's only a few things you should be spending your gold on and everything else you should not be spending your gold on. OK, and so the few things you should spend your gold on are your bag upgrades, going to pack merchants. You can see pack merchants on the map. The first thing that you should always upgrade is your bags. This is going to increase your inventory space. By default, you can hold up to 60 items. By the time you're done upgrading your bags, you can hold up to 200 items. So it's a significant increase in your inventory space. You'll see that I have 210. That was because there's a couple of crown store items or cash shop items that will allow you to go from 200 to 210. It's not a big deal. We won't talk about that much right now. But to go from 60 to 200, what you're going to have to do is make sure you go to a pack merchant. You can hover over symbols on the map until you see the word pack merchant. Here you see pack merchant Azazi. So if you were to go talk to him, he would upgrade your bags 10 slots at a time taking you from 60 inventory spaces to 140. So how are you going to get the final 60 bag spaces to go from 140 to 200? You're going to be upgrading your mount once a day here. Your mount can increase your storage space by 60 to take you up to a total of 200 items in your inventory. Now, now you may choose to grab mount speed first, which means you're going to have to spend 60 days upgrading your mount speed, and then you'll get to spend 60 days upgrading your bags. This is kind of a long term progression. It's really stretched out because you can only do it once a day, but just know that you should always be spending some of your gold on your mount upgrades. This is going to increase your bag sizes. This is going to increase your move speed. And you're always going to be spending it on the back merchant. The back merchant you can blow through in a single day if you want. If you've got the gold, you can go to him and you can upgrade it and it's totally worth it. Same thing with the bank. If you go to the bank, you can increase your bank space. You can take your bank space all the way up to 240 if you don't have ESO plus. And if you have ESO plus, it goes all the way up to 480 because ESO plus doubles your bank space. This brings us into the final thing that you should spend gold on early on and something that every new player puts off for too long and that is food and potions as for the potions you can just use basic essence of magic of potions or essence of stamina potions until you start getting into veteran content right use the cheap stuff they sell for nine gold a piece on traders or they fall off of mobs when you kill them but for the food you should be buying something like ghastly eyeball or witch mother's potent brew these sell for next to nothing they last for two hours so go ahead and buy a stack of them every once in a while make sure that you're always running your ghastly eyeball make sure you're always running your witch mother's potent brew if you're a magic a tune or make sure you're running your lava foot soup if you're a stamina tune these foods are going to increase your sustain they're going to make it so that you're not running out of magicka or stamina depending on which one you use so if you're a new player and you're always out of mag or you're always out of stam it's because you're not using food and it's because you're not using your potions or both they are absolutely worth the expense and they don't cost very much at all they, you will make far more in that two hours than it costs you to equip that food the next thing that we should talk about is research if you go to a bench you can research so if we go to this bench here and there's a research tab basically most of you guys are going to be dps either mag dps or stam dps it doesn't really matter you're all going to be grabbing the trait called divines right here you want to research divines on every piece of gear that you're going to wear so if you're going to wear light armor you want to research divines on your chests your boots your hands right all the pieces of light armor this way when you reconstruct the gear at the transmute station we talked about earlier you can use the divines trait and have the right gear in the right trait very important to research this and it's something you should absolutely start earlier than later and you should absolutely prioritize divines before you get the rest of the things especially if you're a dps because every time you do do an upgrade the next one takes longer so if the first one takes four hours and then the next one takes eight and the next one takes 20 and the next one takes two days right and they go all the way up to 27 days for the final upgrade so if you did divines last and you did the rest it would take 27 days to research divine so research divines first while it's four hours don't research it last when it's 27 days or one of the ones in between the next thing we should talk about is your undaunted keys at level 45 you're gonna start doing undaunted pledges or at least you should have been right? And these are going to give you undaunted keys. That's why we do them. And then we use these keys to gamble for undaunted shoulders. That's the two piece set that you wear on your head and your shoulder. Very powerful set. And it's part of almost every single build in the game. How do you get the shoulders? You gamble for them with these keys. You get these keys by doing pledges that you pick up from the undaunted. One thing to consider doing before you use your keys is waiting till you're 160. This way 
the item that you get will be max level and there will be a chance that you can wear it forever because it's going to be a max level piece of gear. If you use these keys when you're 110 or 120, it's going to be a garbage piece of gear. You're going to have to replace it as soon as you hit 160 with a max level piece of gear. Next, let's talk about alts real quick. If you make a character and you get it up to maybe 200 CV before you decide, man, I wonder what it's like on the other side of the fence. I wonder what that other class is like. A good thing to remember is that you can open up your champion point menu at level one and you can slot that CP that you have all 200 CP on your level one alts. Your alts is going to be a lot stronger from the get go if you spec your CP in right when you create the character. It's going to have better sustain, better damage, right? And some nice quality of life from the green tree over here. Likewise, when you create a new character at level one, you can press H if you're on PC or whatever the mount button is on console, right? And you can use your mounts at level one on your next character. You get your mount at level 10 on your first character. It's just given to you. It automatically appears. It apparates. You just have it. That sorrel horse, that beautiful, beautiful sorrel horse. <laughs> And you get, you just press H and you get it at 10, right? But on your alts, you've already got it collected in your collection. So you just press H at level one and you can jump on that horse right away. Quickly to jump back to gear, uh, you're going to find a lot of gear on your way up to 160 and beyond. Go ahead and deconstruct it, right? You want to come to these benches and you want to open up the deconstruct tab. There's a lot of reasons to deconstruct gear. One, it's going to give you materials to craft with. Two, it's going to level up the bench. This bench you can see in the top left is level 50. That's max level. How do you get it to 50? You get it to 50 by deconstructing gear. As long as it's not a piece of gear that you crafted on that very character, it will level up that crafting line. So very important that you level up that crafting line because it's going to allow you to craft better items, better quality, uh, and unlock your passives that we talked about earlier. So make sure you're deconstructing gear. So you're going to run a dungeon. You're going to get a ton of gear come back and deconstruct it all. Don't be tempted to hoard it. It doesn't matter if it's blue. It doesn't matter if it's purple, right? That's not important. Go ahead and deconstruct it, especially if it's a sub 160 gear, right? It's not max level. Go ahead and deconstruct it. There's a high chance that nobody's going to want it. So don't stress about it. Just deconstruct it. It's an intense intended circle of life that's happening here. You run the dungeon, you get the gear, you deconstruct the gear that gives you materials to upgrade your good gear. And it also levels your bench, a very important cycle. So get in the habit of deconstructing gear and free your poor inventory. Don't carry around all those maybe and what if pieces that you think might possibly be good or useful someday. Go ahead and deconstruct them. You can always reconstruct them at the reconstruction bench. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. Any piece of gear that you find and bind to yourself, you can craft at any time for transmutes. How do you get transmutes? You get transmutes from doing a random daily dungeon. You just open up the dungeon finder and you do a random normal dungeon and you're going to get 10 transmutes per character that you do one on per day. So if you have five characters, you can get 50 transmutes every day. You can get them really fast if you want. A big question that I get is people will look at one of my builds. They'll see that I've got three pieces of set on my jewelry, right? The ring, the necklace, and the other ring, right? Three pieces there. Then they see I've got one two-handed weapon and they go, huh, that's four pieces. How do you get your five piece bonus? One thing to remember is that two hand weapons count as two pieces of a set. Each hand that the weapon uses uh, contributes to one piece of that set. So if it's a two hand staff, it counts as two pieces of a set. If it's a one hand dagger, it's one piece of a set. Okay, guys, I rambled on for a a lot longer than I intended to for this video. This was supposed to be a quick, but man, once I get going, it's hard to stop. There's so much useful information to share with you guys. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like and subscribe for more ESO content and a massive shout out to my YouTube members. Thank you guys so much for helping keep this channel float. Are there any tips you think I forgot? Are there any things that you wish you learned? Or is there any pieces of advice that you could pass on to new players that you wished you knew when you got started? Go ahead and leave those in the comments down below. Be sure to check out the comments down below for extra tips on things to know as a new and returning player. That's all for me for now, and I'll see you guys in the next video.